future. He, uh, <clears throat> beef physiology at the UC Davis, very prominent research school, and then went off to the Peace Corps in Malaysia. <clears throat> and um, he didn't just come home when it was done, he just told me he hitchhiked home. It took him 18 months to reach Italy, and I suppose you gave up and bought a ticket at that point. I ran out of money. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he knows how to ask for the bathroom and order beer in at least 15 languages, he tells me. But he came back and got a PhD in ecology, and for his PhD research, he worked on a small island off of Sumatra yes. on a, an endemic gibbon. And every day he had to pass through the territory of one of two tribes. I guess this island was two tribes control the island. They had to pick one. He picked this one. And he has a tattoo, maybe he'll show it to you on his arm, of a, of a given from that tribe that made him a member, I guess, made it safe to traverse the. And this, you guys think ecology is rough now, but it was, <clears throat> it was a different thing. After, he, after that, he got, his, you know, he got his PhD, then he, he worked in uh, Namibia four years, and his wife, Janet, bless her heart, went with him, and uh, still supporting him in all of this. And he came back and started a career at the Minnesota Zoo starting in 1982, and um, has been a leader both at that zoo and nationally in all sorts of conservation, especially in, well, I don't know if that's true, but certainly in tiger conservation. And he's been... <coughs> If I get these titles proper correct, but he's you know he's basically written a manual on how you manage tigers in captivity. He chaired the Tiger Species Survival Plan of the AZA for many years, and um, was a founding member of the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group of the IUCN, which is a group that's targeted on endangered species originally in captivity, but now captivity and wild. Um, and it brings all sorts of experts together, and we deal with issues such as, you know, pandas or freshwater dolphins or tigers or grizzly bears, individual species at high risk. Where they bring workshops together of people like this, and they, at the end of these discussions, they come up with a plan. And literally, this was modeled after a CBSG working group session. He spent uh, 12 years in the field working with tigers, extensive periods in the field. He basically funded an entire national park in Indonesia for many years, for 12 years, from 250 to $400,000 a year, buying fuel, buying, I suppose, guns, paying salaries, <coughs> paying the expenses while they did research, and he became a very passionate defender of tigers while he was there. He other, also studied tigers all over South Asia. When we met him, I actually met him through uh, some zoo committees, and when the Tigers, Tigers for Tigers was really getting organized. We wanted to have a speaker, and Ron was the first person we brought. I said, I know a guy. And uh, we brought him to campus, and he gave public lectures, and he came to classrooms, and, and so on. And um, later that year, one of the things we asked him was, Ron, you've been all over Asia looking at tigers. Where can we go to see tigers in the wild? And he said, I've spent my whole life studying tigers. I've never seen one in the wild. <laughs> I've tracked hundreds of them for research purposes in the jungles of Southeast Asia, but you know you can't just walk up on a tiger in the wild. Um, they'll stay away from you. And um, and then later that year, he went to India to receive the Kailash Sankala Prize or award for his work in tiger conservation. And I guess Anjana met him then and Pradeep Sankala, and they took him down to the parks in Central India and. When he got back, he was very excited, and he emailed me a picture of himself sitting on an elephant. It was a little on a little a sporty model two-seater. Yeah. Um, he was about this high off the ground. And then another picture is there's a tiger here, and there's Ron and Pradeep and Amahu on elf. There's his tiger. He said, Dave, I know where you can see tigers. And the next year, then, Pradeep Sankala was our honored guest, and he said, well, you have to come to India to, to see our tigers. And we said, sure. And the rest is history. Um, so I have to thank Ron for that, um, and you know we've got some passionate defenders of tigers here. And um, anyway, he's won all sorts of prizes, and he's published 300 popular and scientific articles. I should mention he co-edited Tigers of the World: The Biology, Biopolitics, Management, and Conservation of Endangered Species in '87. Um, the Management and Conservation of Captive Tigers in '94, which is now translated into 
national languages of Thailand, Indonesia, Russia, China, and Vietnam. And in 2010, Tigers of the World, the Biology, Politics, and Conservation of Panthera Tigers, second edition. Ron is a real expert, and he knows the politics, but he knows the biology and the conservation of tigers, and also the captive, uh, the captive population. So it's, it's a great pleasure for me to have him here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. that I had with the students and and I remembered that this was something that if it really could happen it would be quite wonderful and then um, I sort of lost uh, contact with what was going on here and David um, uh, and actually Sean first wrote me and then David followed up a follow-up letter and said this is something I think we're going to resurrect and really get going in a real uh, uh, a serious uh, fashion and so it gives me pleasure to be part of this maybe birth of, of uh, uh, the resurgence of, of uh, Tigers for Tigers. I really wish you all well. And um, is what I'm going to try and do is just simply give you a little bit of um, knowledge about uh, what it's like to be around Tigers if you have that as a professional career. I love snow Okay. Uh, I'm caught, just going to go through a whole bunch of slides of different tigers at different times. This is a Sumatran tiger. And of course, uh, everyone's always asked me what exactly is a, a tiger. And it's certainly, without a doubt, the largest cat in the world. Uh, they live only in Asia. A lot of people think they come from Africa. And there are about 4,000 of them left. So that's all you need to know about tigers, because that's it. And so we have these, these extinct tigers uh, that at one time uh, were found in, in Southeast Asia and in Central Asia, and most of them are here with the uh, come through. And you can see we have uh, the Caspian tiger disappeared somewhere in the 50s and 70s. And I'm going to come back to the Caspian tiger because it holds the future for what the, the what tiger restoration in the Asian landscape is all about. <clears throat> There's also the the Bali tiger that disappeared. Uh, and then the Javan tiger. In fact, I before I even got into tiger conservation, I was working on Javan tigers in Ujung Kulong National Park is where they disappeared. And I was intrigued with what happened and how did it come to be that there were tigers in this park and now there are none. And so the only place that was really left uh, for tigers anywhere where I could be around was Sumatra, which is this next island up uh, from uh, Java. And I went and spent 12 years there in the field, and I'll show you what that's like when I get to it. There's also the uh, Bengal tiger that um, Anjit here has, has, has told you all about, um, and it is without a doubt um, a, a tiger subspecies that has a, a huge history behind it. Uh, Indian politics, Indian conservation movement, it all really started in India in so many different ways. Uh, and then finally we have uh, yeah, the Amur tiger. And this Amur tiger and its connection with the Caspian tiger, you're really going to be surprised what that's all about. Uh, I was one of the first field biologists that used the uh, uh, remote cameras that used infrared beams, and I'm sure most of you know what they are. If not, these are cameras that were designed with an infrared beam that you would attach to a tree have the beam go across the trail where you knew pretty much the tigers were coming up and down. And then these cameras would <coughs> automatically take a picture and they could you could have the date put down, you could have the time put down, and you could also um, and then have it, it, it would flash if it was that in, in the dark hours so you could get a, a picture of these animals. And um, as part of this is that uh, <coughs> unlike tigers in India that uh, have a, a different strategy for catching their prey. Tigers that live in, in lowland tropical rainforest, tropical rainforest, these are very, very dense uh, vegetation zones. And like in Black Gumbus, the, the, the highest level in this whole park was seven feet above sea level. Half of this place is all underwater continuously. <clears throat> and as what you have is this tiger walking down the trail. You notice there to the right, 
Tiger City. And this is how the tigers in, in Sumatra and other places actually do their hunting. They, they just simply go and step off the trail by two or three feet, and they wait until the prey comes by, and they jump off and say, boo. Um, and it, it's uh, quite unnerving to know that you're in the territory of all of these tigers. You can, you can, you can smell their urine, because they pee everywhere. They, you can smell their, their, their feces. You see their, their, their marks, uh, uh, their, their, hoof, their, their, their foot, foot footprints. But more importantly, when the, you're really close to them, you hear this really low growl. <laughs> and that really gets your heart. <laughs> uh, so how many tigers in the wild remain? Uh, in, in many ways, this is um, a fantasy, uh, because no one knows how many tigers are in the wild. So there are best guesses. And uh, I, again, I just went through this. Uh, there used to be a time when they uh, used operants as a device of estimating how many tigers there were that they used in India. And that came under dispute, and it was pretty much shown scientifically that this was a bogus methodology. Whereas this uh, camera trap system is so much more uh, <coughs> uh, accurate, and I'll show you how that works in a bit. But we do know that as many as a, oh, 100,000 tigers were probably living in Asia uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And in 1998, Peter Jackson of the <coughs> Sins Cat Specialist Group estimated this 5 to 7,500. And I don't really know where he got that number, but that's what it was. Um, and then here we have this estimate that came out of uh, India in 2002, and then in 2007 you can see it's dropping. And <coughs> the most recent published peer-reviewed uh, estimate is about 4,000, anywhere between 38 and 5,100, that John Seiden sticker and a number of his colleagues put together. <clears throat> okay, here's, here now we're getting into the real issues about tiger uh, uh, conservation and the future of tigers. In 2005, the tigers occupied only 7% of the historical range. And this was 2005, and they've since lost another almost uh, a couple more percent. So this represents a 93% collapse in the habitat for tigers across all of Asia. And the reason why they can do this is that it's um, pretty easy to have historical records, uh, topography records of what the landmass and what the land cover was. And now, they, with the new satellite imaging, they can really uh, accurately measure uh, the decrease in, in habitat. And so, uh, in recent years, uh, a number of the organizations, um, like World Wildlife Fund and uh, uh, Wildlife Conservation, uh, I uh, don't particularly agree with what they're doing, but they came up with this um, vision that they wanted to have source sites. In other words, they wanted to have big sites where there are lots of breeding females to concentrate our, our few efforts and our, and our few funds for preserving tigers in the future. Um, my particular uh, take on this is that uh, there are so few tigers and so few tiger habitats and every place you go, and I'll talk a little bit about this, there are, there are different threats to the habitat. Sometimes it's logging, sometimes it's mining, sometimes it's, it's overrun by just um, people Indonesia, it's oil palm plantations uh, uh, up in uh, the Russian Far East, it's timbering. Um, so you just don't want to concentrate on large areas, you want to try and preserve everything that's there. And the other way I put this is that um, imagine if you um, started out um, with $100,000 with a financial advisor as part of your 401k. In over 25 years, this financial advisor lost 94%, 93% of your business. And he comes up to you after 25 years and says, geez, I'd like to have another 25-year contract with you to manage your money. Would you hire the son of a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? These are the very same guys that, on their watch, lost 96% of the habitat and 95% of the living tigers on Earth in Asia, and they're still in power. And so I think it's time for a change. There's a historical map, uh, and this is really kind of fun, because uh, it kind of shows, most importantly, where the tigers that came uh, 
out of up there B and D. Because what they could never figure out about the Caspian Tiger is where did the Caspian Tiger come from, which is way up there, and it's on the edge of Iran, uh, Tajikistan, and all of the other uh, Stan countries. And it went extinct very early because there weren't very many of them, because mostly they lived in the river valleys with, um, in reeds where the deer lived, and those were cleared uh, by the people that lived there in pretty much the whole habitat was just simply destroyed, and all of the tigers were lost. So a very, very clever molecular biologist, uh, Carlos Drisco, went and followed the silk route through these areas, and all of those little spots where you see the maps, or the little green dots, he went into the museums and collected samples. <coughs> and from the hair, he extracted the molecular DNA, because only at the last Oh, something like uh, the last 10 years, the, the methodology has been developed in the last five years, it's become very sophisticated. And he made a most astonishing discovery. Uh, astonishing. If you look at the real, the real origin of the Caspian tiger, is the tigers that came from B, they came from the Amur tiger population and crossed over through the rivers and followed the riverbeds down through all the way over to where you, where you see BIR. Then, these tigers had a second migration back to the Russian Far East and populated that population. The Caspian tiger and the Amur tiger are molecular, identical individuals. They're one and the same. So, they're thinking, seeing how all of those are gone, and seeing how we have lots of Amur tigers why don't we think about restoration? And that's what is happening now. And it's kind of an exciting thought, because when everyone talks about uh, the future of tiger conservation, we keep looking at our diminishing number of live tigers. And we can't keep protecting the habitat, because it keeps disappearing under the watch of these idiots that are now in charge. So what do we do? Well, we now have a new option, and that is simply the restoration. And so when we look at, that was the wild tigers, and now we, let's just, let me mention a little bit about the world's tigers considering captive tigers too. And we know in zoos we have these managed tigers and unmanaged. Managed means these are the tigers that are in the tiger SSP, um, which is a species survival plan. And at, at, the, at the root of all of that is that any tiger that is in this uh, essentially managed plan, we can trace its lineages for up to 10 generations, all the way back to its wild-caught mother and father, and we know exactly where it came from. And every one of the births that were, that were made were all registered and all confirmed, and so we have this something like 30-some um, uh, years of, of knowledge of where these tigers came from. And so we know what, their, what their, their genetics are. But then we have, in private circles, this whole mishmash of, of, of what we call private tigers. And there's, there's approximately 10 to 11,000. And we know that we haven't counted them all because they're, they're all through uh, the United States. <clears throat> and so we have a total cop captive population of 13,000 another total somewhere around four and a half. So something like 17,000 tigers. And of course, a good number uh, of that private number, 5,000 are in the United States, and another 5,000 are currently living in the Chinese sweatshops of, um, that they have in northern uh, China. And the Chinese have this idea that they're going to breed up to 20,000 tigers as tiger, on tiger farms, and they're going to use their products in a traditional Asian medicine. I will we'll get to that. And then uh, we move to the next issue is how did some of all of this happen? And of course, conflict uh, with tigers, tiger human conflict, has a huge uh, impact. One of the things we did, uh, we went through the uh, uh, databases going all the way back to the 1800s. And I'll even have, I have some knowledge there. We actually have 
data going all the way back to two and a half thousand years in China. For some reason, the Chinese documented every single bite and every single killing by tigers in China over an incredibly long period of time. And it was in archives, and a guy named uh, Coggins actually went to China and got a couple of professors to help him translate all of this and extract that data. And so you have all of these, these crazy wild pictures of these guys you know, hanging around the gangs that killed this tiger, and, and then the, the British Raj and, and all of their uh, tiger hunts. And, and it wasn't just the British, the, the, uh, there's a lot of people who, uh, the, the, the wealthy Indians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> royal also, who, the royal families were involved. I'm going to just move on. And what happens when uh, all of this happens with uh, you have tigers uh, killing people or killing livestock or just terrorizing villages and eating their dogs is what happens is two things. They either get shot killed or uh, you capture them and uh, bring them into some zoo. And this is a particular male uh, Sumatran tiger that we actually captured uh, in um, southern uh, Sumatra that had killed and eaten three different people. Two men, one women. It was a man and woman eater. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things I, I distinctly recall because we were brought in uh, to help kind of um, process this because we, we found, they called us in and we went hunting and we found the bodies. And it's a pretty gruesome sight to see what a tiger will do to human bodies. So we, we packaged them up in plastic and brought them out. And then we set up the traps. And people always say, well, how do you trap a tiger? And the Indonesians are slick. They build just a simple, really strong wooden cage uh, with a simple trap door, like a box with a sliding door, and with a, li a lever that goes back. And they take a goat, a little small goat, and they cut its ears off and spread the blood around and throw the ears outside. And the little goat goes, meh, meh, all night long. And the tiger comes, smells the ears, yum, yum, eats those, walks in, you got it. Door goes down. So now you have a caught tiger. And there was some smart ass reporter who um, said, How do you know that's the tiger? that killed the uh, <coughs> people, and I knew it was because then something's going on here. Okay. <laughs> if I just go, anyway, uh, one, we had a picture of this guy just before he was caught, and second, I pointed out, if you look in the corner of the, page, of the cage, you see where he's just pooped, his, do you notice what's in there? It was the white underwear of the man he just ate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's gross, isn't it? That's what field biology is all about. <laughs> so, another thing that I was really interested in is because uh, this whole concept of, of people that were going in and, and, and poaching and killing tigers and, all, and everyone always says, you know, and they're shipping them off to China because the Chinese want them for this and this and that. Well, I was really curious, what, was this true? And so, we actually hired... Um, uh, uh, an Indonesian who was part of an elite uh, 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 military intelligence force, and we uh, hired our own, um, essentially, information officers. Another name, best name, they're snitches. We hired snitches to go through all the places that lived in the villages, and they would call whenever any of these, uh, anyone from outside was coming in and entering the, the edge of the national park. And, and poachers in Indonesia are just like what happens in India. Th th this isn't the farmer saying, "Oh, geez, I don't want to go fishing today. I think I'll go. I think I'll go poach a tiger," uh, because they're, most Indonesians are terrified of the forest and they're terrified of being overnight in the forest. But there are certain clans of people who specialize over multi generations in catching tigers. And so what we did is we would have snitches around the villages, and when these guys would come in, they had cell phones, and they would call our field rangers, who had GPS units, and who knew all of the trails, and could be at the 
front of that trail within about eight hours, even walking overnight. And we would apprehend them as, as soon as they were within four hours inside the park. And initially, what we did in, in the early years, our general, uh, and this wasn't me, I didn't make this up, my team decided this is how they wanted to deal with it, uh, is what they did is they, they took everything these guys had, including their clothes, all of their equipment, and burnt it. And then they beat the snot out of them, and then they made them crawl out on their hands and knees, and whipped them the whole way. And everyone says, oh man, that's rude. <laughs> But you know what? You want a performance indicator? They never came back. We never caught the same poacher twice. <laughs> I know. I'm not supposed to do things like that. But the reaction was good. We're all like, oh, yeah. So, uh, and this is, um, uh, in this study, is what it was most remarkable is that. Um, then these guys not only would we, we catch the, many of the poachers, but they were they were working in, in national parks that weren't even exactly in our area. So we had our guys go in and pose as undercover agents, and they were buying stuff from. Uh, and, and what we found out is is the Indo the young Indonesian guys, the you know, the teenagers and young hardworking guys, the loggers and truck drivers, they like to have little amulets of of whiskers or or a little piece of tiger skin. Mm -hmm. They wear it around their neck because it allowed them to assume the personality of a tiger. Well, you know that phrase, tiger in a bed? That's what they thought they had. And that's, they bought it. And guess what? Young Indonesian males bought more of these parts than any other source. It was the Indonesian youth that were killing their own tigers so that they could be a stud that night. <sighs> okay, let's talk a little bit about tiger species viable plant. It was, it was actually developed by this guy, most wonderful fellow, Ulysses Samuel Seal, um, probably one of the most brilliant people I ever met. Uh, he was an endocrinologist, and he was the man that developed um, the techniques for immobilizing tigers, the drugs that you use for immobilizing all of the wild animals, because he was just really interesting. He slept four hours a night. You never had a hotel room with him if you went to a conference because he'd get up at 1 in the morning after going to bed at 9 and he would start typing on this typewriter and then he would start asking you questions. <laughs> hey, Rowan, when, 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 we're, when, when we're in Bangkok doing that? You know, and, and you'd never sleep when you're around this guy. He came up with this great idea of creating this scientific, collaborative, and coordinated approach to the management of endangered species and this was in 1980, 1981. And it, essentially, it's just essentially maintaining this genetic diverse tiger populations as a genetic insurance policy. It's just real simple. You get together every year, and you know how many tigers you have in all of your different zoos. And what you want to do is to simply look at the genetics of each and every individual of, of the breeding males and the breeding females. You don't breed the really young ones, and you don't breed the really old ones, but you do the middle-aged ones. And you match up the most distantly related males and females. So I would transfer about 40 tigers every year between the 210 zoos that cooperated in this, and it would bring together these new mates, and then they would breed and have their young. And we kept um, this uh, going. Uh, I took over five years later, so it was 27 years that I ran this program. And one of the things, again, a performance indicator, is that just about seven years ago, they developed uh, molecular technique that could extract DNA from feces. And this was a real find because what we could do is we collaborated with the Siberian Tiger Project run by Dale Miguel in the Russian Far East and he collected feces from wild living Amur tigers and we brought it to the United States and we compared it with Amur tigers that were not out, uh, were, were completely separate from this living population and they compared it and the genetic diversity between the captive moor tigers in North American zoos is greater than that found in the Russian Far East for the wild tigers. Quite as significantly so, it's something like 96 to 88 percent. And of course, there's all of these other things, but that is sort of 
it's a blueprint for managing tigers so that, and, and I always said that I don't really particularly think that zoos have a real niche in conservation until they start getting involved with wild populations and supporting wild research, supporting conservation efforts, supporting protection efforts, or even, most importantly, and this is where my vision was for the future, I really envisioned using genetics of zoo-caught animals to augment wild populations when they started reaching critical low levels. And so we have the master plans in the stud book. These were kept by a lady who worked for me uh, for a number of years, it still does. And uh, since 1982, um, this is kind of a nice factor, uh, I, I was essentially the guy who managed, not even managed because the zoos really did it all, I just sort of was the head of the committee, uh, 419 uh, young tigers were born in this population, more than in the wild, uh, that lives in the Russian Far East right now. So I felt good about that, and so here's a mother with her tigers, and now here's the other side of the coin. This is what China has put up. It reminds anyone who has any real knowledge of uh, World War II, uh, the Nazi extermination camps at Dachau, Yes. It's exactly the same. They take these tigers, uh, they, uh, they throw the female in when she comes into estrus uh, with a number of males, and then she delivers cubs. They take the cubs away from her immediately and stick them on sows. And the sows, the pigs, nourish the tiger cubs. And as soon as you take the cubs away from a mother, her oxytocin stops. And so she will come, she will stop uh, uh, production of milk, and within 30 days, she comes back into estrus. So they'll breed this female three times a year. This is against the nature. It's against nature. It is not natural. It, uh, and then those cubs are taken and put in with sows, and their goal is to get 20, they're up to about 12,000 tigers now in these camps, and they're going to 20,000. And everyone is really quite upset about it, and I can understand why. And I, um, I really have a lot of respect and admiration for the Chinese, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, but that part really annoys me. Okay, now I'm just kind of jumping back to the field, because all of this was a progression. Um, I started this in 1995, is when ExxonMobil decided to start up the Save the Tiger Fund, and I was one of the recipients of, um, they vetted me and decided that I was going to receive a lot of money, and I did. But I didn't have to kiss the devil. <laughs> Twelve year study, and, and I, if you just look at that photo, uh, you can see how wet and sloggy it is. Uh, it, it was pretty, uh, I had to get used to this because this is right on the equator. It's about 92 degrees every day, and it drops down to about 88 at night, and it's 92% humidity, and you're walking in water practically all day long. And we had these cameras, which I'll show you, stretched out over 126 kilometers, and it would take us three days and two overnights to change the batteries and change the film. And um, during that period of time, uh, and all of the other surveys, is what happens, two things, is one, um, all of the skin from your knee down sloughs off like a snake changing its skin. Um, and two, um, all of the little, ugly little, um, what are they? Leeches. Thank you, yeah, I was thinking something worse. The little leeches, the little leeches burrow through the, the, the your, where your boot, uh, shoe strings are, blood. and go through your socks, and they start on your ankles, and then they start moving up your leg. And you had to, after, you know, after you take your foot off, uh, you'll have a cup of blood that will pour out, because when the leech drops off after sucking you for three or four hours, and when it's full, it still has uh, injected enough uh, anticoagulant into the wound, so it continues to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. And so you lose all of this blood. Uh, but it really gets worse when they get up into your underwear. 
<laughs> now we're talking. Now we're talking important stuff. <laughs> and I used to really hate that, um, but it was part of the, it was part of the life. And so there I was on the fifth largest island. And by the way, David, uh, the four Mentawi Islands are these four right here. Okay. And I was on this island right here. Okay. And then there's these three down here, and this is the big island, Stone Island, Neolithic Island, on Neos. That's where I did my four-year period of study. And here we have, uh, think of California. If you put California up against this, it's exactly the same, except California has mountains on the west, or on the east, and this has it on the west. It's the same shape, same length, but there's 45 million people island and 80% um, of them are under 21 years old so it's going to really have a real problem there's seven national parks and um, here's where we were doing our work this is uh, the study of the lowland rainforest where I was working and this is the park here and we had an area that was about here this is about 40 miles by 30 miles okay 130,000 hectares. And then we had our GIS maps that showed where the vegetation was. These were all villagers right here, so it was a hard boundary. And that's where we set up shop. I hired um, seven Indonesian field biologists, and over the course of the next several years, I added 22 rangers. Um, I speak mainly, I speak Indonesian, and I only spoke Indonesian when I was there. No one ever spoke English to me, and I wouldn't reply in English. Um, and these guys were um, really pretty good at what they did. And so here are the, just to show you the, the sites of where the cameras were all located. And um, we would go out, and initially we tied our uh, cameras, our infrared cameras, to trees. But what we found out was that at night, elephants move from one feeding area to the next. And elephants, when they're walking down a trail and the flash goes off, it pisses them off. <laughs> elephants don't like to be flashed. It scares the bejesus out of them. And so they would, they would take our cameras and smash them. They'd pull them off, and sometimes they'd throw them 30 yards away. <laughs> so we came up with this ingenious idea of uh, putting together uh, Essentially, this we welded together this rebar, and then we dug a, a one-meter hole, filled it with cement, pushed the legs down in, and then wrapped it in bob wire, and, whoops, go back. That doesn't matter. Is what happened is uh, it really worked, uh, because the element really would grab things with its trunk and you wrap it in bob wire. They don't like that, so they left our things away. And this is how we, we would sleep. We would just simply... Now, it's real important when you're out in a place like this, you don't sleep anywhere near <coughs> the trail. Because as remember, I told you that elephants move from feeding place to feeding place. And if you're sleeping out on the middle of the trail, they're going to step on you. Because sometimes there's 10 or 15 of these guys all in a line. So we would just lay out a, 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 a tarpaulin, plastic for the bottom, and then a rope or a branch with a tarpaulin over the top, because it's always dripping. You know, it's drip, 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 drip. You know, they always, I always said there's, there's, there's four seasons in, 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 on the equator. Rain, rainier, more rain, and lots of rain. And then it goes back to rain. Um, when you go out on these uh, three, four day trips, um, we would have to carry our own food. And what you do is you wear um, one pair of uh, field clothes. And usually for me it was a pair of socks, a pair of boots, a um, pair of shorts. No underwear because you get rash really quick out there. And a t-shirt and a hat. And in your pack you have a Ziploc bag that has the same things. So when you get at the end of the day and you're making camp for the night, you go and wash in the little stream and then you take your warm clothes, or cleaned or dry clothes out, put them on. And you get up in the morning when you're feeling pretty good and you, put, you take all of your dry clothes off and you put them back in the bag. And then you get to put on your wet pants and your wet socks. God, I hate wet socks in the morning. I never got over it. I hated wet socks. 
Uh, but if I took extra dry socks, all the guys would know it and make fun of me all day long. <laughs> so that's how we did things. And so, here we are with some photographs. And this is, uh, we have some beautiful photographs. This particular female, uh, she's called uh, Chin Chin Ima, so I let the guys um, name them all. Uh, Chin Chin Ima, Chin Chin is um, ring, and Moss is gold. And she has, from both sides, this continuous, unbroken band. Goes right around, and very distinguished. And these, these stripe patterns are like individual fingerprints. You can tell every tiger instantly once you get the, the, the eye for them. And Chin Chin Imas, um, she was like a real uh, prima donna. She went, walked through the cameras constantly. I think she was really uh, <laughs> happy with herself. And uh, then she disappeared for three months, and we thought maybe she was some happened or poachers came in. And then she showed up with her three cubs. These are four-month-old cubs that she has, and here they are, uh, same cubs at uh, about nine months of age. Wow. You see they're sniffing that camera uh, stanchion there? Not playing with it. Um, this is one of the males in that same territory. It could well have been the father, but we don't know that. Uh, they call this guy, and you can tell he's a, a much older, a very mature male, because the males uh, develop these real dark mutton chops on the sides of the face. And uh, they call it, this guy, Gembong Rahana. <laughs> and uh, Gembong Rahana translates as big badass of the forest. <laughs> okay, here's a, like a real young, uh, yeah, almost immature thin tiger, like a teenager. Another tiger. Another male. Another male. Uh, and one of the things, I told the staff, don't you dare name a tiger after me. And oh. about six, seven months later, I showed up and I was looking through the site. I said, oh, who's this thing? They said, oh, that's Lewis. That's my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look, Lewis has this scar, has another scar on the other side. It turns out Lewis just got his butt kicked everywhere he went. <laughs> 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 He was really a wussy man. <laughs> I was really embarrassed about that, in a sense. Um, okay, more tigers, another day for tigers, and we just have, uh, over the course of uh, 12 years, we took 14,788 photographs. Uh, and so it's, a, it's quite a, an inventory. Another guy. And those were all just tigers and not anything um, else? Some of them were other animals, but yeah. a good share of them were tigers, yeah. Yeah, we were really good at photographing tigers. And so that's, it, we kind of come to a, my talk here. So why are tigers so important? Because where tigers live, biodiversity thrives. And these are the other kinds of photographs, the different ways that the internet works. And I only uh, bring this up uh, simply because uh, this is something that I helped start at the Minnesota Zoo for the zoo. Uh, so what we're trying to do is duplicate a model developed by Sarah Christie in Europe with the European zoos. Because what was going on is you get these European zoos, North American zoos, and they all want to do a little bit for conservation. So they want to send you know, $100 here, $500 here, $10,000 here, $15,000 here, $10 here. And they don't know where to send the money and they don't know how to follow it up. So she came up with the idea, let's get a group of people together and, and call it, uh, she called it 21st century. The zoos all send the money to ZSL, Zoological Society, and they have a separate account where that all goes. And then she meets with representatives from all of the zoos that contribute to this fund on a yearly basis at the annual meetings. And then they all decide on the projects that they want to fund. And it's pretty close to what we're trying to do now in North American zoos. And it's pretty close to, I think, the thinking that you guys have. And it's not necessarily just funding, because there's this whole thing with this uh, tiger conservation campaign. How many times did somebody say raising awareness? Awareness. How much? How many times did aware? It was it was all over the place. You guys are doing exactly what everything. Uh, tiger photo sharing. You can you can get into that uh, when you go on your your little trips to India. You can you can post those photos and get a lot of people really excited. And then you have these overviews, and it's it. I just thought, whoa. And I was going to delete these slides because I didn't want to 
Um, I didn't want to let you think that I was more clever than I am, uh, but I decided I'd rather be more clever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and remember, I told you all, Global Con uh, Tiger Conservation Day is July 29th. I don't even know who uh, coined this. I think probably World Wildlife Fund. And I understand it's the <coughs> summer, and you're all off doing your own thing, so you might want to change that. But <clears throat> it's a good idea. And finally, is what I would like to just say it's, it's your turn. Don't fail. No pressure.